Recording in progress. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to uh, the final interactive session um, from APSA of the 2022-2023 academic year. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to host a session on NAH training grant for dual degree students. Uh, I wanna start just right off the bat by having our wonderful panelists go around and introduce themselves, including their name and current institution. Uh, so I'll just be efficient and calling you by name. So um, we'll start with Cynthia. Hi everyone, my name is Cynthia Tang. I'm a fifth year, uh, I guess incoming sixth year MVPhD candidate at the University of Missouri. And I'm the incoming president elect of the American Physician Scientists Association. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, Carrie? Hi y'all, um, I'm Carrie Jansen. I am finishing up my seventh year no, my eighth year at Emory um, in the MSCP in Atlanta, starting my final year of MD PhD training. Um, I am the outgoing vice president of APSA and um, incoming treasurer of APSA. Thanks, Gary. And Caroline. Hi, my name is Caroline Coughlin, and I'm a fourth year grad student, so finishing up my sixth year overall at the MSTP at the University of Miami. Wonderful. Thanks, all. Uh, so I just really want to emphasize how grateful APSA is uh, and the audience is for all you coming on tonight to share your experiences. This is APSA's first webinar on these types of NIH training grants, and we hope to build and expand on the topic over the next year and coming years. Um, my name is Eli Wisdom. I'm a MD PhD student at Oregon Health and Science University. I'm currently just beginning my PhD rotations. Um, yeah, and I'll be the moderator for the evening. Uh, so just a quick announcement for those who are going to step away or miss a piece of tonight's webinar, uh, we will have it recorded and posted to APSA's website and um, YouTube page. And eventually it will be broadcast as a podcast episode on the Double, Do Double Docs podcast. Um, for the audience, if you have any live questions, um, put those in the Q&A box. Uh, we will have someone moderating kind of the chat box, but the Q&A box will be the most efficient way. And I think that's all the announcements I have. Um, I think Cynthia is going to start us off with some a few slides to get the ball rolling on a intro. So Cynthia, take it away. OK, can you see the screen OK? Wonderful. All right, so I'm just going to start by giving a brief overview of what these grants are and what they involve, um, and then we'll move into the Q&A. So these are NIH National Research Service Awards, or NURSAs. These are individual fellowships, which means that uh, when you receive them, you are the PI on these grants. To be eligible to apply, you need to be a US citizen or a permanent resident. And then the, there are two fellowships that are available for pre-doctoral trainees, um, and these are both of open to uh, MD, PhD, and DO, PhD trainees. So F30s are specifically for dual degree trainees and can fund you for up to six years, including your research years and your medical years. And then the F31 is for PhD trainees specifically, and that can fund your research for up to five years. So to start out, um, you wanna start by reading the program announcement, and this is available on the NIH website. You want to check for the updates to their requirements because those do change every, every once in a while. Um, download the application instructions for the fellowship and that is available with this link. And there are many moving parts to this grant. So I'll be showing you a, a list of all of those in a little bit, um, but you do want to create a checklist or use a checklist that other people have made to make sure that you hit all the points. Um, you want to talk to your PI as early as possible and let them know that you're interested in doing this so that they can help you out. And then your grants administrator, um, who was my best friend, they're the ones that will keep you on track and make sure that you are getting everything that needs to be submitted in. And they can also help you register through the ERA Commons, which is where you'll be submitting the grant. So these are all the different parts of the grant. You start with a project summary, which is about half a page long, and this is an abstract of your research. You have the project narrative, which is a three sentence summary of your study. And this is uh, supposed to be available and understandable to the public audience. 
you have the applicant background and goals for training. So this section is about you, your past experience and your goals during this fellowship period, a one page specific aims page on your study, a six page research strategy, the research or the respective contributions is the part where you talk about who did what for this grant, why you selected your sponsor or your PI and why you selected this institution, how you plan on training for responsible conduct of research, your sponsor and your co-sponsors, if you choose to have some, will put in a statement. And this is like a letter of recommendation for you as well as what types of resources that they have available for you. Letters of support, and these will include collaborators, contributors, people that are going to be part of your training. These are separate from letters of reference and you can submit three to five letters of references. And these are people who know you well, but are not part of your training team. And then you talk about the institutional environment and commitment to training. So you wanna show that your environment, your institution has the resources that you need to succeed and that they're committed to your training. And then finally, you have your bio sketch. And then these are the review criteria that they will be uh, scoring you on. So they'll be looking at you as an applicant, your sponsors, collaborators, and consultants. So who is on your training team? They're going to look at your training plan, your training potential, and then your institutional environment and commitment, their commitment to your training. So that's my brief summary of what this is. And we can move on to the Q&A. Awesome, that was, that was really helpful. Um, yeah, so I'll invite audience members to submit their questions in the Q&A. I pulled a bunch of questions that were pre-submitted um, from the registration. So I think I'll just kind of start right off. Um, I'll just like call on one of the panelists and then we'll kind of go through if, if any of you have yeah, things you want to add, feel free to jump in. Um, so I'll start with Caroline. For how long, like the question is, how long does it take on average to prepare an F30 or F31 application? Like from the time that you finally submit it, how long before then did it take you to write yours? So I think I started mine, I submitted December 2020. So F30s, there's three submission dates throughout the year beginning of April, beginning of August, beginning of December. So once you have a date in mind, it's good to start planning, backtracking as to when to get things done. So I started writing in March um, of 2020, which kind of aligned because we got stuck home with the pandemic. So I did a lot of my um, non-research training writing then. And then I did all like the non-research related stuff that was done by August. And then September, October, November, I was finalizing all the research related components of my grant. Wow, that's certainly a lot. Um, Carrie, how about you? How long, how long was yeah. your timeline? Um, I would say not quite as long, but maybe with a caveat. So uh, my program has like a pretty strong grant writing class that we're more or less required to take. And so that class walks you through the bulk of writing the research proposal. Um, you still you still have to do a lot of the kind of supporting documents on your own. Um, but I took the class in the spring semester um, and wrote my proposal over the course of that class as it was assigned. Um, and then didn't really do much more on it until in the fall. Um, I would say I like I sort of gradually would write the supporting documents over like August to October um, as like I had lulls and experiments and stuff. And then I would say I spent like November really revising that proposal. I don't think, I think it just depends on what you have going on in the lab and like what kind of preliminary data you have and how much of the supporting documents you're writing from scratch versus like if you have kind of a skeleton from um, people that have gone before you in your program or in your lab. Um, I would say you probably need at least a dedicated month if you're only going to do that for a month and and longer if you're going to try to do experiments mixed in um, but i recommend doing the supporting documents kind of gradually over time because doing them really well can really boost your application 
doing them okay is fine, doesn't really hurt you, but doing them poorly can really hurt you. So if you try to do them over time when you have more time to dedicate to them and not at the end when you're like really trying to get everything in your research um, proposal tied up nicely, then it can really kind of strengthen your application overall. Thanks so much. So kind of a related question, and Cynthia, I'll start with you on this one, but is there like an optimal time like during the dual degree program that you should like apply? I mean, I'm thinking, you know, folks start their PhD, they do rotations, they probably might do their qualifying exams before applying for the F30s, but can you maybe fill us in more? Yeah, so you do have to apply within 48 hours, or 48 hours, 48 months um, of matriculation. So you have four years, you have to apply. The first submission needs to be within the first four years. Um, most people, I think, will apply towards the end of their first PhD year or during their second year once you have some preliminary data and you, um, you're you more established in your lab. I think it helps to show that you've made progress on your PhD. So if you have your qualifying exam, I think that's great. Um, definitely try to have your committee formed so that you can talk about them. But I did not have my qualifying exam done when I applied and it worked out. So it's not required. Okay, great. So kind of, yeah, being mindful of that 48 month timeline of when you first matriculated into medical school and now you're presumably in that, you know, two years into your PhD almost when you like, that's the deadline. What do any of you know? So I'll ask Carrie, do you know if there is a, what's the resubmission process like? So if you, you hit that deadline, you apply within 48 months, what is like, do you know what the resubmission um, timeline looks like? Yeah, so I actually resubmitted my grant. I, it was not funded on my first submission. It was funded on my second one. I would say that you should go into this process like more or less expecting to have to resubmit it. Like most people have to submit their grant more than once to get it funded. Um, it's not quite so kind of dismal as like R01s if you've like heard your PIs talking about that, but um, a lot of people do have to resubmit the vast majority of everyone that I know that has one submit resubmitted at least once. So I would go into it expecting it to resubmit, but importantly, <clears throat> you only have to have your initial submission done in that 48 month window. So as long as you submit your first submission, which is called an A0 submission in the first 48 months, you can submit your resubmission in the next, like after that time period expires. Um, for me, I resubmitted mine on a pretty tight timeline. So I submitted my A0 in December and I resubmitted my A1 in April, which is a very, very tight timeline because your um, review section is generally not until like several months after the deadline. So I had, I think, like a little less than two weeks to resubmit, um, which was like probably not super advisable, but what needed to happen for what was going on in my life at the time. Um, so I would say most people tend to get their their um, like comments and stuff back um, a couple months after they submit, and then they'll resubmit for like the next deadline. So generally, people re like skip one of the deadlines and resubmit the next one. So like if you submit it in December, you're likely to end up resubmitting in August. If you submit it in April, you're likely to resubmit in December. That's really great. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Uh, the next question uh, I see on here is like, what do you guys have it for like recommendations for folks who are being mentored by more like junior PIs, like kind of in the context that these F30, F31 awards are training awards. And so the basis of you getting funded is somewhat like contingent on you being in a really great training environment. Do any of you have experience, um, you know, with kind of a more junior PI as your main mentor and how would you strategize that for an F30? I have a pretty junior PI. I was my first, my grad student's first, um, my grad, my PI's first grad student. Um, and I was co-sponsored on my grant by one of his mentors. So the, my co-sponsor was my PI's mentor on his K99R00 that he had. Um, and he's like a close mentor to my PI as well as all the people in our lab. And so that was like a natural fit. Um, and it kind of, if, if you have a young PI who does like work closely with someone more senior 
which they likely do, it kind of fits nicely to fill in any of the holes in your training plan that reviewers might try to poke to say, this person isn't senior enough to train a grad student super well, or they, they don't understand like the challenges that might come up and all those sorts of things. But it, it kind of is a nice parallel because on the flip side, there is occasionally the concern from reviewers if your PI is someone who's like very, very senior, that they don't have time to personally like one-on-one -on -one train you. And so having a young PI and a like more senior co-sponsor kind of helps fill those gaps where you have like the reviewers are sure that you'll get lots of day-to-day hands-on training with your younger PI, um, but then also still have the kind of like oversight and additional like funding for experiments and all those sorts of things from the more senior person. And so I would recommend um, trying to find a co-sponsor if you do have like an early career researcher as your PI. That was really helpful. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Caroline, I want to ask you, um, let's see, um, are there advantages or disadvantages to applying like for an F30 versus an F31, depending on your stage in the program? Do you have any insight on that? I honestly have no idea. <laughs> Do any of the other panelists have uh, insight on kind of the F30 versus F31? I can talk a little bit about it. So um, if you are in a fund, NIH funded MSTP, then you have to check to make sure that the institute that you are asking for your grant to be sent to um, accepts F30 applications from funded MSTPs. The vast majority of them do, but there's a couple that do not, in which case you would have to apply to an F30, for an F31 if you are at a funded MSTP. If you're not at a funded MSTP, that doesn't really matter. The other distinction, um, is that the F31 does not have the 48 month um, expiration date. So if you're if you get beyond that 48 months, then you can still apply to an F31. So say, for example, you applied to an F30 and you submitted it in your 46th month of training, you didn't get it, you reapplied and you didn't get on your reapplication. You're out of the F30 window now, but you could still theoretically reapply to an F31 at that time. The only other like sort of substantive difference is that the F31 will only fund your graduate school training years. It will not follow you back to medical school as some people say. Um, so it will terminate when you, when you graduate from your PhD, even if you have years of funding left, which is not the case with the F30. In a funded MD PhD program, that isn't like a super huge consequence to people. So it doesn't matter the most. A lot of programs may give you like a small raise for bringing in like the grants, but um, that part of, I think, is not super critical at the end of the day. That was really helpful. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. And that was definitely new information to me. Okay, Carolyn, I'm, I'm coming back. I'm going to come back to you since I asked you a, a hard question last time. So um, one is, do you need preliminary data in order to apply? And how much, if so? So I would say preliminary data is helpful to show that your project has a track record. What the grant um, reviewers are really looking for is that your project is something that's achievable within your grant period and that you have support in the lab from techniques um, or whatnot to support the research. And one thing to note is the preliminary data doesn't necessarily have to be what you generated. So there are other people, if like a postdoc or someone else in the lab has generated a lot of preliminary data, you can show some of that, giving them credit for it. If you've been working on some stuff too, that's great to include, but you don't need extensive preliminary data. It The more, the better, I think. Um, I think it all helps, but it doesn't necessarily have to be 100% your own generated data. I would also add to that. Um... An approach that I used was um, if I didn't necessarily have preliminary data for my specific study um, that I was proposing, I also kind of did a proof of concept. If I've done that type of analysis or did that type of work, I did include that to show that either I knew how to do it or that it was possible. And kind of jumping back on that and looping something else in, you have letters of support, which are from collaborators. And what I used is I knew that in my lab, we didn't have super strong bioinformatics or, or mouse 
stuff. So I had letters from the core facilities who are going to be helping me with those experiments, write letters explaining how they would support very specific pieces of my research strategy and then mentioned it in the research strategy. See letter of support from XYZ core who will be helping me with this specific spot. So even if you don't have the skills yet or will be learning them or there's someone at your institution who's gonna be helping you, having them write those letters of support which I don't know if there's a limit of how many you can have. I think I had a few, um, but those can be really helpful um, for techniques or whatever you may need. Awesome, thank you both so much. Um, the next question, I, I'm gonna pose it to Cynthia just because I, I believe a lot of your PhD work is, is kind of more computational based, but what advice do you have for, for someone who's PhD work is, you know, more purely computational. Do you have any advice for, for them for applying for F30s? Sure, yeah. So my work is, my PhD is in bioinformatics. Uh, so all of my work is genomics um, and data analysis. Um, for me, I spent some time talking about where the data came from and how the study was formulated and how, how to put that problem together. Um, I also try to tie in a lot of health relevance. Um, I will say I didn't have a problem with it um, in terms of the reviewers being concerned about just purely computational work. Um, but I will say in the training plan, I did talk about integrating um, some biological training as well. So immunology, uh, virology, I, I study viruses. Um, so just kind of pulling that in to show that I am having that aspect of training. Um, yeah, I think that part was helpful. Great. Okay, the next question is, how do you decide like which NIH institution do you like apply under? Um, Carrie, do you want to start us off on that one? Yeah, um, I would apply to whichever is most like relevant to you and um and if i recall correctly you can like request both your study section and your institute but there is some discretion up to like the people that receive it at that age where it gets actually routed generally you get sent where you ask unless you like ask for something that's like clearly very different than what you wrote in your grant um I would say apply to whatever is most relevant. Like, don't be like, oh, like I think maybe like NHLBI has like notoriously like generous pay lines, but like if you don't have like a heart, lungs, or blood project, like you're not going to get funded. So it doesn't matter because like that's not in what they're interested in. So apply to what is relevant to your work. If you're like, if it's very applicable to like two things, like say you do like neuroimmunology and so it's applicable to like the Neuro Institute and the Immunology Institute, then like, you could try to look online and see if those institutes publish their pay lines and, and ask for whichever one is, is more favorable. I will say not every institute publishes their pay lines, so you may not have as much traction there. Um, you can kind of ask around, but at the end of the day, I don't think any of them are like hugely, hugely different um, across the board. Um, some may be a little more favorable than others, but I don't think you're talking about like dramatic differences that are gonna make or break it really. I want to add, although not everyone publishes their pay line, there is a spreadsheet on the NIH website. I don't remember where it is exactly, but it does say how, like, what percentage of people that apply for F30s got it for each inst institute. So that might be something to look into as well. I will say the uh, one caveat to that document is that it's it's like how many people were ever successful. So it's not like just first time submissions. So like for me. It took me two attempts, but I was funded. So that percentage will be like artificially higher than the actual pay line, like per round of funding. It's still useful data, but you just go into it knowing that that does not equate to the pay line. Great. All right. I'm going to pose this question to, to all three of you if you have any uh, experience. But is there, are there any advice for folks who are more kind of public health? Uh, research related versus, you know, wet lab, like research related. Any of you have experiences in kind of a public health aspect? Mine wasn't exactly public health, but I think it's similar. It's more, it's sort of epi related. Um, I don't, 
I don't think it really matters what type of research it is, as long as you have a good hypothesis, you have good methods that support your hypotheses, um, and you have the health relevance. I don't think you're at a disadvantage for doing a non-traditional type of science. Yeah, I agree. I think it, a well-written proposal will be well received um, if you have like the adequate like mentoring and training and research plan. I have a good friend from my program that um, has a funded F30 from NIAID and she is um, a public health scientist. And okay. one last thing, I think the research is not secondary. I think they look equally like you as an applicant and knowing that it's your first time probably so, or applying for an NIH grant. And so they're really looking for the training documents and they're trying to fund you. And if your research is <clears throat> like, I, I think they're equal components. So like what Carrie was saying, taking the time to spend a lot of time on the non-research components is really important too. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So along those lines, Caroline, so you've got, you know, great training environment, great mentorship, all the resources at your disposal, but now you have to craft your, uh, you know, how do you kind of craft the narrative um, for the F30? So my institution, we have a box drive where people who've had successful grants are um, even people just have their examples of their grants up. So you can just access them and I think recently someone from our program made this whole like guidebook on how to apply to an F30 which I didn't use but having successful <clears throat> examples is really really helpful um, just to kind of get a sense because everyone writes it a little bit differently so if you have a couple examples and then particular to your institute I think that's also important um, especially depending on your graduate program, like I applied to the National Cancer Institute. So the couple examples of students that I was looking at were from the cancer institute or doing cancer biology PhDs. So I could have looked to see how they talked about their classes and the components of that um, specific graduate program. So I think it's really important to have examples and just people to talk to who've done it before to give you advice to kind of get you going. Uh, Cynthia or Carrie, do you guys want to add on to that that great answer about kind of crafting the narrative? Yeah, I think it's like any other application, like applying to like MBPG programs and anything else. Like you want to craft a narrative about who you are and what you're doing, um, and you want it to be cohesive. So like you want your letter writers to like mention the same goals that you mentioned in your training plan that your mentor mentions in their sponsor statement. Um, and all of those things, like you want it to be all internally consistent, obviously, because you're like selling this to your study section as like a package of like, here's who I am, here's like why I'm prepared to do what I propose, and here's like all the ways that the people around me are going to support me and train me to like accomplish the research that I propose. Um, so I would say just like think about it that way, think about like how to tell a cohesive story that like kind of ties it all together and and really authentically represents your goals and kind of to answer another question that was asked in the q a like i think that's something useful to think about in um selecting your letter of recommendation writers like you want people that can speak to your goals and your capabilities um so that like for me i had a letter from my undergrad pi a lab that i had rotated in for my phd um is it two or three letters and, and maybe it's another rotation that i did um, and so it can be anyone that knows you and can speak to your like strengths as like a developing scientist, even if, you know, like I know in, in COVID, some people may have not had as many rotations, like it can be a collaborating lab. It can be like, um, you know, the director of your graduate program, if you've like worked closely with them or something, um, it just needs to be someone that can speak to like your gifts and strengths and your goals. On the line of letters of rec too, and letters of support, um, one strategy that I use to try to keep everything very cohesive, and I think this is just helpful uh, anyway, anytime you're asking for a letter of, of rec, but just bullet pointing the items that you want them to focus on and really highlight, um, I think was really helpful for them and for the grant. Um, and then I would also add, if you didn't get very, many research experiences in the past, 
um, because of COVID or for other reasons, uh, one of my letter writers, so we can submit three to five, and I asked someone who, um, I, was, I was going towards the public, route, public health route, so I actually asked someone that I had worked closely with um, on, on some initiatives, and they had nothing to do with my research. I've never done research with them, but they were able to talk about my interest in that area and my potential and uh, passion for that kind of work. Really helpful. Thank you. Um, so Cynthia, I'm going to come back to you for this next question. And the question is, you know, I would be the first in my institution to apply for an F30. You know, where can I find examples of fully funded F30s? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you were the first one in your program to, to have a successful F30. Can you kind of fill us in on where you look to, for guidance? Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I was the first in my institution, and what Caroline was saying earlier, um, I reached out to a lot of people from different institutions for their examples, and that was so helpful. Um, and we are working on making a national database somehow um, to help individuals that do not have access to these large databases at their universities. Um, but in the meantime, if you don't have any examples, I'm sure you can reach out to any one of us and we'd be happy to share ours. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah, Caroline. One thing I think one part um, that we have to write for the F3031 is a bio sketch and I never written a bio sketch before it's kind of like an expanded resume. Um, so I think that the NIH website has examples of bio sketches or at least a template to use. And so that's another part where you're basically including every research experience you've ever had in your entire life. And so that's one way to craft your story because you're writing paragraphs. So kind of going back to what Carrie said, I think you have like a personal statement kind of section. And then under each research experience, you're writing little paragraphs and whatnot. So that is a good way to craft your story. Um, and there are examples of those online as well. Thanks, Caroline. So I actually have another question that's kind of along that same vein of the bio sketch. So the, the question is, what are the non like research components of the application? Does this include outreach plans and professional development activities? Can you speak to that? Like, is there space in that bio sketch area for that kind of information? So for professional development activities, I think there's a section um, I should looked at my grant right before this, but yeah, there's a, a training in professional development where you talk about the different classes that you're going to take in your graduate coursework, your medical school training. So there are, there's kind of a lot of um, freedom in that section to put types of training experiences and professional development activities that you plan to do during your training. So you can talk a lot about that there. Your bio sketch is kind of like what you have done and how it's going to support you in your grant and your career moving forward. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to bring the, the discussion back to the letters of recommendations, a couple other questions here. So um, I guess, first off, you know, how far in advance should you begin contacting professors or physicians for letters of support or reference? Um, and is it uh, recommended to have a physician as one of those writers? Starting with the second question, um, if you are applying for an F30 especially, it's a really good idea to have a physician as a letter writer because you're writing a grant that's for dual degree students. And so as part of your training plan, you wanna make sure that your research component and your clinical components are very cohesive and they're both, they both need to be really strong. Um, I'm not sure about the F31, but I have a feeling, especially since you are a dual degree trainee, it's still helpful to you um, to have a physician on there. Uh, and then how early to start, as soon as you decide you want to do a grant, <laughs> you can start sending those emails and give them plenty of time to do it. Really great, thanks so much. Okay, so the next question is, I'll pose it just to, to all three of you, but are there any good online resources that that you use when you were writing this? Like Carrie, it sounds like your institution has a really kind of um, 
you know, workhorse kind of infrastructure for helping you build these, but were there any external resources outside of um, your institutions that you used? I will say the person that like teaches and pioneered the program at our institution has like published extensively about trainee grant writing um, over like decades actually. Um, and so I'll make sure that that literature is like incorporated in Cynthia's database that she's working on. Um, but you can find some things like out there like that that are kind of like reputable resources to refer to if you don't have those resources at your own institution. I would like generally recommend staying away from like student doctor network Reddit type things because they're never helpful. Um, and trying to like find networks of students who have been successful before you, even if that's not at your own institution, like trying to connect with someone like via APSA or another way to find people at other institutions who might be willing to help. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, Cynthia, sounds like, you know, there's a, definitely an opening for APSA to kind of be involved in supporting uh, current trainees and kind of this application process. So hopefully we can, yeah, drum something up in terms of a grant bank or peer support. Um, so the next question I want to ask um, is, so the, the question is, F31s have a diverse, diversity grant, F30s do not. Do you know if F30s have any opportunities or considerations for underrepresented students? I'm not I'm sure. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not sure either. <laughs> right. Um, I think if you do have that aspect, if that's an important aspect to you in your application, um, your bio sketch, you write a personal statement as part of your bio sketch, and that might be a good place to include that. Okay, great. Yeah, super helpful. Um I'll bring it back to the difference between F30s versus F31s. Carrie, I know you were talking earlier about how the F30s are more focused for dual degree students. F31s are also open to just kind of PhD researchers, but would a dual degree student be more competitive in an F31 pool, even though there's more total applicants? And is there is there any reason that if you're within that 48 month timeline from when you matriculated that that one would choose to apply for an f31 over an f30 i think generally no i think you're probably unlikely to be like any more competitive in f31 than you are in f30 um because the per, the study sections are literally the same like the same your grant whether you submit an f30 or an f31 on the same deadline are going to be reviewed by the same pool of people um, so the like, kind of like the sort of popular notion that an F30 is has tends to have a, a bit more favorable pay line is really more a numbers game than it is like an like a kind of advantage thing just because there's more people applying for F31s. Um, and again, that difference is like not dramatic. It generally is like fairly inconsequential. So I I think the real advantage is that the F30 mechanism can fund you for longer. Um, and that may be good for your program. Like my program gives us a small raise when we get these types of grants that pay for like a certain proportion of your stipend. So that's nice. It's nice to have the like extra, the like extra funding on top of the stipend funding to use for like, I mentioned in the like written questions, like during my medical school years, I've used that to pay for my UWorld subscription. Um, and I've used it to go to conferences. Um, and so that it like, I wouldn't have to like go back to my lab to have them fund it and that sort of thing. So it's nice to have the like more years of funding, but that's really the main difference. Like, I don't think there's a reason to apply for an F31 if you're eligible for an F30. Um, that being said, if you're not eligible for an F30 because of time or institution or whatever, I think it's also totally fine and won't like impact your life long term by any means. Really helpful. Yeah, I didn't know that the kind of funding would carry over to your last two years of medical school and that that would be yeah quite useful if you were wanting to go to conferences and stuff after you left your PhD. Um, Caroline, I'm gonna ask you the next question. Are there any NIH commitments for students on these F30 or F31 grants, such as serving on study sections? Um, so not that I 
know of. Um, the only like I think thing that you have to do once you get the grant is annually you have to write your RPRR, which I'm blanking on what that stands for, but it's kind of like this is what happened this year, this is what you're doing next year. It's a very short document that you have to fill out and submit through your grants office as kind of formally what happened. And I guess the behind the scenes budget um, will go into that as well, but that's something you have to do annually once you receive your grant. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question I saw in here, um, I think would be useful for, for everyone, but which is, you know, is there any advice any of you would like to share on how to constructively and emotionally deal with post F series grants submission process? So it sounds like, you know, maybe plan on a resubmission, but you know, I think as, as MDPHE students, like what, there's always these deadlines that we have to like meet. And then there's, you know, the anxiety of waiting to see if you're successful and, and dealing with that. Do any of you, uh, have any insight, like, you know, how, how to kind of deal with that in a constructive manner after you've applied and maybe you're waiting for the results or you found out that you need to resubmit? So I think one thing in terms of channeling your post-grant energy, um, I did my qualifying exam after I submitted my grant. So I immediately just took that document and basically turned it in as my qualifying exam. So, and that can work both ways. So depending on when you do your qualifying exam, turning that written part into your research strategy is really good. There's also, um, I do like hematology research. And so, so there's some foundation grants that they have for like training, um, training, trainees. So you can look for other places to stick your grant, especially maybe it wasn't funded the first time you're nervous about funding. So using um, what you have and channeling it in other avenues is a good way to kind of handle that anxiety in that way. Yeah, our institution or my department, at least um, for our comp, we have to submit an R01. So having done the F30, I just expanded my methods um, and added more results. And that was the comp. Um, I will say, obviously, we all hope that we get it. But even if I didn't get the grant, I think it actually really helped speed up my PhD because I spent so much time looking through doing the uh, doing the research, doing the literature, um, coming up with the methods, understanding what needs to be done, what to do when things go wrong, all of that. And having that all outlined in one place, I think was really helpful. Um, in terms of decompressing, I took, I took time off <laughs> after I submitted my F30. Um, I also resubmitted uh, and the first time I submitted, it, it wasn't even discussed. Um, so that was hard to hear, but they still give you some feedback. And after you take some time away from it, it's really, it is really good feedback to go through and um, yeah, just take the time to see what they said, how to improve your grant and, and just keep improving. Yeah, I would say, um, I would echo what Cynthia said, which is the most valuable part of submitting these grants is learning to write them and how the grant submission process works. So like honestly just getting it submitted is an achievement in and of itself and a huge learning opportunity. Like you, like it's building skills that you'll use for the rest of your career, whether or not it's funded. And then that is like truly the most important part. It's nice to, for it to be funded, but learning how to do it is, is far more important than actually having that line on your resume um, or like the money that comes with it. Um, because you're like the money is just like not that much in this game of science money. Um, so uh, the other thing I would say is like let yourself go through like different phases of like how you feel about it. Um, when I got my comments back, I had like so I like I had to go through a phase of being like, oh, my reviewers are such idiots. They like how do they not you know like obviously this isn't like they don't understand and like this isn't right and all these things. And one of my mentors gave me really good advice. It was like, I can't like, he was like, feel whatever you want to feel, like feel mad about it. Like go like talk to your friends or your spouse or whoever and like yell about it. But then you can't start like re, you can't start revising until you've like gotten past the phase of like wanting to call them idiots. Like you need to like, cause you need to start writing your revision from a place of 
what did I not explain well enough for them to understand what I'm intending to do or to communicate like who I am and my training potential and stuff. Um, and coming out of revision, whether it's for a grant or for a paper from that perspective, I think is like really edifying and like figuring out how to conquer like what's been asked of you and, and piecing apart like what you may be able to say better in a different way. Or like if it's pay-per-view, what is like a truly unreasonable ask that they've asked of you? Like once you get through, it's like almost like stages of grief, like the initial anger. And then once you get like kind of settle out to a place where you can be like, how can I better understand this? Um, like what they're coming from and how to like explain it to them better, then then you can really kind of move forward and and do well in the revision process. Those are all really insightful answers. Thank you all. Um, and next question, there's a couple more, yeah, a few more questions, but so how long after you resubmit, or sorry, after the first submission, how long does it take to hear back? Uh, Caroline, do you know how long it took you after you submitted? So I submitted beginning of December and I think you kind of, I think it was March before I really heard anything, if it had gotten discussed or not. Um, so it's a while, so it's okay to forget about it for a little while <laughs> for your own mental health because it's just waiting and then some they'll give you I think a number um to figure out where you are in terms of the pay line and whatever but they don't tell you like you don't even find that out I think it was not until May I think so like even six almost six months later where I found out that it actually had gotten funded so it's a very long process and then also take into account that like your institution and the grants office has to process everything so it was almost a full year after submitting the grant that I actually started well we had more issues more than a full year before I started getting like actually paid through the grant so it's a very long process and it's an interesting experience just on the administrative side I think you learn to appreciate all the non-writing components that go into grant work um, because the administration part is sometimes half the battle Okay, great. So there's definitely quite a bit of time after you submit. Um, yeah. next so question. just like a word yeah. kind of on that, like about how it works. So you submit it, a review, like a, a study section reviews it, which is made up of like a bunch of scientists that are from various institutions around the country. Um, and then they give you a score and that gets posted like online. You can review it. Um, so you can see like your actual score and then like what percentile that puts you into compared to the rest of the study section. And you can, if you like ask around, you know, like what scores are typically fundable in that study section or like for these grants. And that gives you an idea of whether or not you may be funded, but you're not technically funded until later on the committee for your specific NIH Institute recommends you for funding. So this is like what people mean when it's for like an F grant or for like a larger grant. Someone's like, oh, I'm like kind of borderline. I, I may or may not get funded, right? They're waiting for that like committee to decide like who's actually getting funded in the end. Um, and then after that is when the paperwork start, stuff will start with your institution. And then eventually you'll get what's called a notice of award, which is the like official documents. It's like you are definitely funded. And like Caroline was saying, that can come like many, many months later. Like I was kind of, my resubmission was like, uh, like almost certainly fundable, but not like slam dunk fundable score. And I like, so I was kind of like, I think I got it, but I'm kind of waiting to hear. And I think my NOA came in like October after a December submission. So it can be a long time. Great. And we had, we had another question that is like, could you please define pay line again? Carrie, could, you might be able to tackle that one of like, what is, what is the pay line? Yeah, so like grants in general work in the way that they go to the study section, right? They get reviewed by the scientists that review them. They, they like score them. Um, and those scores, I think it may depend a little bit on the study section, whether they get like averaged or added together to give you an impact score of like how good your grant is. Really what matters is whatever um, percentile that equates to, because it's like where that falls in terms of like how you rank amongst all the other grants that were in that study section. Um, and there's like obviously a finite pot of money. And so they're going to fund however many grants down into the percentiles they have for the pot of money. Um, so the pay line is kind of just like the approximate score or approximate percentile rank that people um, talk about as far as like what's fundable or not. Okay, great. Yeah. And it sounds like 
some of those pay lines are public knowledge. Some of those you might have to go digging uh, for the information. Okay, um, last question, and this is for all three of you, but um, what is something you wish you knew before you applied for these F30 or F31 training grants? Um, I'll, let, I'll let whoever wants to start off, uh, go ahead. Um, I'll say this varies very widely institution to institution, but um, our like, trainee grant office at Emory is like to not always like it's they're not like actively involved in your like submission process and checking things um and so I would say you know and like so in my initial submission like the person that had to do the paperwork on the like institutional side of things like left a document out of mine and it like impacted my initial score um and so in retrospect I wish I had like kind of asked more questions and really checked like all of the things before we like hit the final button um because i don't know that that really would have like changed the outcome of not being um funded on the first submission but it felt bad obviously um and so i think i would like really kind of take more ownership over like managing the paperwork part like i was naive at that point and was like oh like this is their job like i'll just give it to them and they'll just do it um but i like i think i would do that part a little bit differently in retrospect I have to agree with Carrie. I had no idea the administrative component um, that went into the grant. I was like, oh, I'm just going to write it. Everything's going to be fine. But I really had to be on top of the grants office to get everything done. And it's an office, so there's multiple people. So figuring out who to talk to, when to talk to, you can't start that early enough. So talking to people who have submitted before or to your PI, because in our institution, it depends on the department your PI is in. And so they see like one F30 31 a year and just don't have the experience on how to handle them. So just knowing that beforehand and knowing um, just you have to be super persistent and on top of everything to make sure everything actually gets done. That's really important and something I didn't know when I started. I agree. Um, it's really important to take ownership over your grant. And so I would I would have looked over the, they have the instructions um, and all the components on the NIH website. So just going through and actually taking the time to read all that before you start and knowing what are what is actually required, have it all, put it in a spreadsheet, um, make a checklist. And I think that helps everybody. And you can share that with, with your grants people, um, with the grants office, with your PI, and then everyone's on the same page. Um, and then I also, there are so many parts to the grant that you don't need your research for. Um, and so like the bio sketch, uh, the training, the applicant's training and goals, things like that, you can start so early. And I would have started that way earlier uh, in hindsight. Wow, that was great. Yeah, thank you all so much. So before I thank the panelists and end the call, um, I just wanted to make, you know, one quick announcement, and that's like the virtual content team at APSA, which I co-chair with Anna Kolstad and Jenny Jin. Um, we are recruiting new members and new panelists for this next academic cycle. So if there's anyone in the audience who would want to help kind of create these types of webinars for current trainees or for applicants, uh, we'd love to have you on board for the next cycle. Um, APSA is a organization that is run by trainees and for current trainees and pre-trainees. Um, and at least for the virtual content team, the, the, time, you, the time commitment is very manageable um, and it's pretty flexible. So I'm gonna put two links in the chat uh, for folks who uh, wanna learn more or want to join the virtual content team. Um, so I think we will wrap up just because I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. Can um, I add but, something real quick? Yeah, of course. I'm Cynthia. so sorry. Um, so APSA, we are, like Carrie mentioned before, we are working really hard to try to increase access to resources for grant writing. So if there's anything that you feel would be really helpful for you, reach out to one of us and let us know and we'll do our best to make it happen. Yeah, thanks, Cynthia. And yeah, we definitely are in terms of like these this F30, F31 grant cycle, we're trying to drum up some yeah excitement by current trainees so that you know we at APSA can develop some sort of helpful resources for folks. So I'm gonna plug my um, email into 
the chat. And we, yeah, I'd love to hear if people have recommendations or want to head part of that effort up. I uh, would love to have you on board. Okay. All right. So um, now I just want to thank you to the panelists uh, for your time. Really thank you to the audience for asking great questions. I hope you guys, uh, you know, got a lot of in great information out of this. And I hope that, you know, this webinar is something that we can continue on in the future and maybe have multiple kind of tracking the cycle of the F30 application process. Um, we are planning out the next uh, round of webinars for the following academic cycle. So stay tuned uh, to APSA's social media and our email announcements. Um, and that's all I have for tonight. So thank you again, panelists. Really, really helpful information. And thank you, audience members, for asking great questions. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Take care.